What do you do when you have a brand new 3D printer, a government mandated stay at home order, free plans for a Commodore PET Mini, and a retro computing YouTube channel? I'll give you one guess. Hello and welcome to Operation 8-Bit. I'm your host Tony Landy and over there behind the camera we've got Sparky making sarcastic comments and giving us fun facts. For those of you who are new to our channel, keep an eye out for those. They pop up from time to time during the video and they look like this. Also, make sure to stick around to the end of the video to catch some of the bloopers and outtakes from this episode. Okay, let's get going. A few weeks ago, we were poking around the internet doing some research for upcoming videos, and we came across a really neat project from fellow retro computer enthusiast Lorenzo Herrera, aka Tin Cat. Lorenzo developed his own version of a mini Commodore PET 8032, complete with a working screen and a hinged lid that lets you get at all the parts inside, just like the original. As he says on his website, the Commodore PET is one of the most iconic looking computers of the 1970s. It reminds us of an era of frenetic innovation, harsh competition, and bold design choices that shaped the computer industry as we know it today. Lorenzo was generous enough to post all of the instructions and the 3D models on his website, so we thought it would be fun to build one and show you how we did it so you can make one for yourself. As part of this project, we're also going to show you how you can add multiple vice systems to RetroPie, and we're also going to show you a little trick on how you can get your Commodore emulators to boot right into BASIC. Let's start by taking a quick look at some of the parts we're going to need for the build. We'll put a complete list to all of the parts with links to everything you'll need for this project in the description below. At the heart of our pet mini is this Raspberry Pi. For our build, we're going to use a Model 3B Plus, but you can use a Raspberry Pi 4 as well. We picked up a complete can of kit that came with heat sinks, a power supply, and a power switch. It's important to have a power supply that puts out enough juice since we're going to be using this to drive the monitor and an amplifier as well. For the display, Lorenzo spec'd out the Waveshare 2.8 inch screen for the Raspberry Pi. However, that display uses a serial communication bus, which is kind of slow and has very low frame rates. Another thing about the Waveshare is that it's designed to use the full set of GPIO pins, which means that we would need to run a 26 pin ribbon cable from the base up into the monitor box. Given the limited amount of space we're working with, this could be kind of tricky. Instead, we're going to go with a UC Tronics 3.5 inch HDMI display and do a build similar to the one that Matthias Baprogel did. This will give us a slightly larger display without the refresh rate issue. We'll still be powering it from the GPIO pins, but the wiring will be much simpler and easier to route inside of the case. There are a few other odds and ends like this micro USB extender with panel mount, a panel mount switch that will wire in line, some screws, and two high strength magnets. Next, let's take a look at the 3D models for the case and see how it all fits together. As I mentioned earlier, Lorenzo made all of the models available for download from his website and his GitHub page. I've opened them up in Fusion 360 so we can get a better look at each one of them. There are a total of 8 parts that need to be printed starting with the base. Notice these cutouts on the side. This is where the body shell will snap into place so that we can pop on the hood. A neodymium magnet goes here and another one goes here underneath the keyboard to keep the unit closed. Our Raspberry Pi mounts on these standoffs to the left hand side. 
On top of this, we'll add the body shell and a small stand that the monitor box will sit on. Inside the monitor case, we'll mount the frame that holds the LCD monitor in place, and then we'll finish off the front with a bezel to complete the look. On the back, we have the rear cap for the monitor case, a power switch, and finally the micro USB extender. We're going to print out the parts in two colors. Black for the base, the monitor frame, and the keyboard, and then we'll use white for the rest of the pieces. Up until a few weeks ago, whenever we needed something 3D printed, we would reach out to our friend Garth Olivier over at 3D Print Direct here in Frisco, Texas. However, as we started to do more projects, we decided it would be worth investing in our own machine. Garth recommended that we get this Creality Ender 3 Pro. It's a great starter printer that's easy to use, but it's also versatile enough for more complex projects, so we won't outgrow it too soon. Now, as cool as it is to watch a part you designed in a computer become a tangible object in the real world, watching a print in real time is right up there with watching grass grow. So let's get a look at the process in time lapse. I'm pretty happy with the way the parts came out of the printer, but there are a few things that we want to do before we start putting it all together. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, we went with the HDI version of the case, but we did get a slightly different display than the one the plan called for. So unfortunately, that means some of the ports are covered up. Instead of just taking a Dremel to this, we decided that we should reprint the part. This is a real simple change, so I just brought the model into Tinkercad and created a blank space on the area we wanted to get rid of. We made the same change to the monitor frame and the case as well, and then we went back and reprinted all those pieces. Now you can see how the display snaps right into place in the new frame, and the ports aren't obstructed anymore. Another thing that we want to clean up are the layer lines, which are a typical artifact of the print process. They are a little hard to see on the video, but they're really obvious off camera. Finally, we want to paint these white pieces to give the case a little more of an authentic appearance. We're going to start out by standing the parts down with a coarse grain sandpaper and then move to progressively finer finishes as we go along. I'm going to use this mouse sander for the larger areas and then I'll hand sand to get into any tight spots that it can't reach. We're going to do this out in the backyard because the process throws up a lot of plastic dust particles that get all over the place. I'm also going to wear a mask to make sure that I don't breathe any of that crap in while I'm working. Now that all the parts have been sanded, we'll hit it with a few coats of primer. I like to use an automotive primer for this type of work since it'll help fill in any minus surface imperfections that are left over after sanding. I've masked off a few areas that I want to keep clean for when we glue everything together, and this will make sure that we get good adhesion between the parts. We're applying the primer in thin layers and giving it about 10 minutes of dry time between each coat. This makes sure that we get a nice even finish without any runs or drips. I'll finish this off with a light hand sanding using a very fine grained sandpaper so we have a nice smooth finish before we start painting. As with the primer, we want to use multiple light, thin coats of spray paint. I'm using a slightly off-white color with a satin finish that I think will give it a perfect retro computer look and feel. The paint does dry a lot slower than the primer, so we're going to wait about 30 minutes between each coat. While we're waiting for the paint to dry, let's turn our attention to getting the Raspberry Pi set up. For our build, we're going to use Retro Pi. This is a super popular Linux distro that's typically used to turn the Raspberry Pi into a full featured game console, but we'll be able to use it to run our Commodore PET emulator as well. From this page, I'm going to download the version that matches our Raspberry Pi model. Once the file's downloaded, we're going to need a utility program to burn the image onto a card. For this, I like using Bellina Etcher, since it can handle a number of different formats, including the NewZip format, which is the compression used for the RetroPie image. 
This is great because it saves us the extra step of having to unzip the file first. Once that's done, we can pop the SD card into our Raspberry Pi and power it up. For our first boot, I connected this to a regular HDMI monitor and a keyboard. And it's a lot easier to navigate around RetroPie with a gamepad, so I connected my C64 joystick. It's kind of hard to see what's going on from this camera angle, but I'm basically just walking through the first time setup and configuration process. I'm also enabling SSH so I can remote into the Raspberry Pi from my laptop and finish the setup with my screen capture on so you can get a better look at what's going on. Vice is a free Commodore 64 emulator that runs on Windows, Linux, and a bunch of other operating systems. It's actually the same emulator that Retro Games uses on the C64 Mini and the C64 Maxi. In addition to emulating the C64, Vice also has emulators for the VIC-20 and the PET. By default, RetroPie doesn't have this installed, so we're going to get that set up now. From my desktop, I start my SSH shell, and then I logged into the Raspberry Pi with my default credentials. From here, I can get into the RetroPie setup with this sudo command. From the menu, I'll select Manage Packages, and on the next screen, I'm going to select Manage Optional Packages. As you can see by this list, RetroPie has a bunch of different emulators to choose from. We're just going to scroll down until we find Vice, and then I'm just going to have it install from the pre-compiled binary since this is much faster. You can also install from the source, which will get you the latest version. The install process takes a few minutes, so I'm just going to skip ahead to where it's finishing up. And now that we're back to the main menu, I'll just exit out of the setup program and reboot the system. Another minor irritation that I have with RetroPie for a build like this is that even though the C64, PET, and VIC-20 emulators are available on the system, it won't display on the menu unless it has ROMs in the respective systems folder. Sure, this is fine if you want to load up and play a game, but what if you want to fire it up and start cranking out a program in BASIC? Well, we found a super easy way to make this work. Every Vice emulator has a built-in feature that allows you to save the complete state for later use. We're going to use this feature to create a snapshot of our emulator state right after they boot up. I'm going to start by firing up the pet emulator on my laptop. On the menu bar, click on snapshot, and then we select save snapshot image. Now I'll just save this to my local work folder where I have all my other pet ROMs. I'm going to name this file 00boot so that it's the first file that gets displayed in the games list on RetroPie. Now to test this, I'll exit out of Vice, and then I just drag and drop the new file onto the XPET executable. And there we have it, our Commodore PET is all set up and ready to go. All I need to do is copy this new file over to the ROMs folder on the Raspberry Pi and we'll be good. Our LCD display is designed so it can sit on top of the Raspberry Pi like so, and it gets its power from here, and it gets its inputs from the touchscreen from these pins here. Now obviously this isn't going to work for our setup, so what we need to do is run a set of wires from these pins to here so the display can sit in the monitor case and the Raspberry Pi can sit down in the base. What we did for this is create a set of jumper wires. I have this set for power and this set for the other GPIO pins. Each one of these is color coded and they'll connect into the screen as I've illustrated in this diagram. So now to power the display, I just plug the wires into here and then connect them to the board like so. There's red. All right, there's the black. So that's the power. I'll do the same with these wires for the touchscreen, and this will route very nicely inside the case. 
Okay, let's get this thing put together. And this has already been a really long video. So, how about we do this part 80s movie montage style? lot of fun putting this little guy together and I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. The screen is a bit tiny and I'm sure that you can't see it on the camera. So here's a close-up of what we got running right now. I would like to give another shout out to Lorenzo for putting the models out there for everybody to use as well as assigning us our official 0013 as our registered serial number. That number is kind of special for us. For the past 10 years, that's been the number of the support vehicle my wife and I drive for the Tour de Force 911 Memorial bike ride. As a reminder, all of the profits from any ad revenue that we make from this YouTube channel go to support organizations like the Tour de Force who in turn use those funds to support the families of law enforcement officers that lose their lives in a line of duty. For a complete list of the charities that we support and how you can help, please visit our website. I've left a link to that in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video and you'd like us to do more content like this, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that thumbs up button. Well, we hope you did enjoy this video and we'll see you next time on Operation 8-Bit. It reminds us of an era of 
frenetic and in a bit blah. Should we go with frenetic or frantic? Frenetic. What does frenetic mean? Can somebody Google that? Take your time. Showtime. I'm guessing that's working. So I can see what's going on on the screen. Yay.